Thank you very much, uh, Marcus. And uh, we will continue with the presentations, and, uh, but be active with questions and discussions uh, afterwards. Uh, now we have heard uh, presentations about uh, the, the, we have set the landscape in the world's biggest sport in, in football, but we have lots of other sports, and we have uh, now, uh, we have a real expert uh, who will uh, set the landscape in other sports, that uh, Dr. John Orchard, welcome, uh, who you, I'm, I'm sure you all know, um, uh, John, and uh, he is so active in so many sports. I heard that you have been in cricket uh, tournament uh, just before here, yep. and uh, you ha he has published a lot of papers uh, uh, about the injuries in so many sports. Welcome, John. Thank, thanks very much, John. And um, um, Okay, and, uh, and well done, well done, Marcus. That was was a good start, particularly good since it didn't overlap too much with what I'm going to say. So <laughs> um, I'm pleased that we're we're going to cover different areas, but also very interesting because that's the first time I've seen Marcus's data, and it's very consistent with the data that very consistent with the data that I'm going to present as well. Um, I'll start by saying I may be about to confuse everyone with the. Uh, with the terms that I'm going to use with respect to football. Hopefully everyone is aware, but I'll remind you that um, if you take away the real football sub-sports like futsal and indoor football, uh, then there are five other major distinct football codes all around the world. So when I talk about real football, I'm now going to call it soccer in this presentation, so you don't confuse it with Australian football, which is a different sport, and, and just to make it even more confusing, there is an Australian soccer team playing in the final of the Asia's Champions League in the Middle East today, so um, there'll be lots of people talking about Australian football and referring to soccer or the real football, but we have a different code of, of Australian football, of course. Then there's two major rugby codes, rugby league and rugby union and Gaelic football and American football are unique sports as well. And so there's a lot of football codes to compare and uh, the different play in the different sports is, is fascinating in terms of the rates of groin injuries they, they, that occur in those sports. In um, the other sport that has a very high rate, as we'll discover, is ice hockey and ice hockey has to be um, distinguished from field hockey. So um, the nomenclature is very difficult. but. Uh, but uh, worth, um, worth following and worth understanding as much as you can about these sports because if you see them play and you realise why certain sports have higher rates of groin injuries than others. Uh, the the uh, um, presentation that I'm making will take the form of a systematic review. I, I just thought that there was enough um, clarity in the literature that I could do a systematic review as opposed to a narrative review, but um, some may disagree and think that I've stretched the, stretched the uh, definition. I, I try to use the closest available statement um, for conducting the review, which was PRISMA, um, but PRISMA is, um, uh, is guidelines for a, a systematic review for interventional studies, and really there is there's no appropriate guideline to use for this, and, it, and it's, it's a, a clue that we... Um, should be, um, you know, some, someone from this group or, or a group of us from this group should, should try to put together guidelines for synthesising um, injury epidemiology studies in sport into a systematic review because PRISMA is not quite appropriate and the STROBE um, statement is also not appropriate. The STROBE statement is guidelines for conducting your own single study, not for synthesising um, uh, the um, observational injury epidemiology studies. And I used a little bit more of a complicated search strategy than Marcus did. Um, and then I had to also try to exclude uh, soccer or football studies so that I didn't overlap because we want these two papers to um, complement each other and be covering different areas. Um, so I also decided to exclude, obviously, papers where there was no adequate incident data presented. Um, I, I used ten, 10 team seasons as a cutoff, so I didn't exclude a single team paper, but it had to have a lot of seasons to be included, and um, did include some, or did include one soccer study 
as part of a group of multiple um, team sports and there's, a, there's a, a, an extremely good series of papers from the NCAA that included football or soccer and, and multiple other sports so it was worth um, comparing these because they all had the same methodology and um, excluded um, a duplicate or a, um, um, excluded some of my earlier publications. Uh, I've published Australian football data and done a series over time and, and only kept the most recent ones of those rather than duplicating earlier studies that had published um, data from, from earlier on from the same system. Um, my results uh, finished up with 31 studies and 15 of these were 15 separate studies from the Journal of Athletic Training um, all looking at NCAA sports and it, it is really a sensational series of, of studies because you can compare male and female and you can compare multiple sports um, with, with exactly the same methodology to really get some good indications of the, the relative incidence between sports. Um, like Marcus, I found that the, the biggest challenge with this was that different studies use different injury definitions, so medical attention versus time loss, and then within groin, some studies would look at all injuries of the hip and the groin region lumped together and some would look at only the muscular ones or the muscular and tendinous ones grouped together and then separated uh, articular um, injuries uh, in, into a different definition. So um, you're not comparing apples with apples and again this is why we need a, uh, perhaps a, uh, a consensus paper to work out how, to, how, to, how you approach this when you've got different definitions used in different papers. From the NCAA studies, the these are the sports in terms of match um, incidence rate per thousand athletic exposures. So the, the, this group preferred to use um, athletic exposure rather than a player hour, um, but they're, they're not dissimilar because a lot of sports go for close to one hour for one exposure. Um, and uh, the highest sports uh, were the men's sports and the, the um, football codes and men's lacrosse um, snuck in there. It's another sport where you have a lot of change of direction, but it wasn't as high as um, men's football, men's ice hockey, American football, and then some of the women's sports of the same variety came in to, to fit the slide in. I didn't include all the other ones, but the other major college sports were all included, so that if you can think of other sports like baseball, etc., they were included in this and uh, they were getting lower rates and um, when we publish this as a, as a paper, you'll be able to look at the chart for all the sports. So you're looking at the moment at the highest risk sports. Um, there were three sports that had exactly the same sport where you could compare the incidence between males and females and when you combined them, there was a um, risk ratio of um, about two and a half times greater um, incidence rate of groin injuries for the male sports compared to the females. This didn't reach statistical significance in ice hockey, but probably only because the, the data for women's ice hockey didn't have enough um, exposure. It's likely that it's a significant difference if you, if you had bigger numbers. Um, um, but combined and looking at basketball and soccer together, you definitely find more in males, and that's obviously a consistent finding that with, with Marx's data. So s certainly being male is a, is a significant risk factor for getting a groin injury. Um, the reason for it is we can debate, we, we can describe the, the, that finding and then all can debate the reason for it. Um, although we haven't got data to support it, I think in clinical practice uh, an injury in the hip groin region that's on the opposite side um, of that region, the lateral hip pain, we we see in clinical practice that's more common in females to so get trochanteric bursitis, gluteal insertional tendon tears. Um, so it's possible that the shape of the pelvis puts more load on the outside of the pelvis in females and on the inside in males. Um, and I think that's the most likely explanation. Um, it's also possible that males, because of the deficiency of the inguinal canal um, wall strength in males compared to females, that that predisposes to groin region injuries. And it's possible that both of them are the case, but requires further study, but you know, very interesting area for debate, which I'm sure people will go into later on in, in the conference. When you look at um, the non-NCAA sports, again, the various football codes um, uh, rate highly. I've got three slides which look at the highest to lowest sports 
in the different um, ways that we can compare and uh, percentage of all injuries is one and then incidence rates in terms of player hours and per season. Uh, so these were only sport or the high sports that I was able to extract groin as a percentage of all injuries and Gaelic football, um, which is played almost exclusively in Ireland, was the highest sport um, using this criteria. Um, Australian football was also very high and they're very similar sports. So of the, the, they are the two sports most related to each other within the football codes, um, Gaelic and Australian football, and they can, there is a combined hybrid rule that you can play Gaelic football players against Australian football players um, because of the similarity. Um, and they're, they're both sports that use punt kicking, um, and, but punt kicking on the run, um, and, and that leads to a high rate of groin injuries. Um, and a lot of change of direction in both of them. Then when you look at um, injury incidents per thousand player hours, um, there was one study that was well above all of the others in terms of incidents, which is ice hockey, um, although it did um, look at all injuries of the hip and groin region, so that, that's one of the reasons why it might be so high. But without a doubt, ice hockey is certainly an extremely um, high sport for groin injuries and uh, deserves a place sort of at, at the top of our consideration and, and different mechanisms. And I, I, my conclusion based on observation is that um, perhaps you need, perhaps a sport that has two particular mechanisms in combination um, will lead to a really high rate of groin injuries. So with respect to the football codes, it's kicking and change of direction together lead to a high rate of groin injuries. And with ice hockey, it's probably skating and body contact together. So um, we don't have data for ice skating itself here, but probably a combination of the ice skating plus the body contact where you're very regularly stretching the groin region because of players colliding into each other and also colliding into the side um, um, that, and, and overstretching on the ice um, um, all together um, potentially create high stresses on the groin. And this, this one looks at incidents per 100 player seasons and again there's a couple of ice hockey studies that are very high. Um, the cases are my summary of the definition, so that's all presentations and all onsets which then tend to give you higher rates compared to, I've got NGT which is missed game time only and AO is all onsets, MO is match onset only and TO is training onset only. Down the bottom there you've got rugby union there were two, there's a study that looked at match injuries and training injuries and separated them and, and you can see that the incidence rate during match play is higher than in training. Um, with respect to the AFL, which is the Australian Football League, so the sport in my home country that we specialise in Australian football, um, we have a long-standing injury surveillance system that um, publishes annual data and over time, if you combine groin and hip injuries, there's no significant change in the rate, but the rate of hip injuries is increasing over time and the rate of groin injuries is slightly dropping, although not significantly. So um, there's certainly been a trend over time for more hip injuries to occur and we don't think that that is due to mechanisms changing so much as the diagnosis of hip injuries is increasing. So it's a significant increase over time in, um, in trend, line trend for hip injuries um, and the rest are staying relatively constant. Um, the, um, the, the, the groin versus hip differential diagnosis I'm sure we'll go into later in the, in the conference but um, imaging is tending us towards um, diagnosing more hip injuries and then um, it's also an interesting area as we're aware that you've got the overlap of the general surgeon and the, and the orthopaedic surgeon um, and they're, they're all going to be biased towards making a diagnosis in their, their own field. But I won't go into uh, that too much because there's sessions devoted to it. Um, so in conclusion, agree with um, Marcus entirely. The, the data shows that males have a higher rate. Um, ice hockey and the football codes um, are the um, sports that lead to the highest rate of groin injuries. Um, by exclusion, um, the rugby codes and American football have lower rates than soccer, Australian football and Gaelic football and that's because of less kicking on the run. 
Um, stationary kicking does not appear to be as much of a risk factor. So if you are, there's less data to support this, but the absence of data probably suggests that the rate's low because people aren't highlighting it, that if you're, a, say, a punt kicker or a goal kicker in American football, you don't have as high a rate of groin injury as a um, soccer player who is running and kicking. You're doing more kicking if you're a specialist puncher or goal kicker but you're not changing direction in doing it. So you, load, you appear to load the groin less by doing lots and lots of kicking, but in a straight line and standing still the whole time, um, as opposed to... And, and didn't get in the first paper, but you know, we'll cast a question marks about goal, goal keepers versus outfield players. I'd, I'd imagine outfield players in soccer have a much higher rate of groin injury than goal, goal kickers, and it's because the goal, goal keepers are doing kicks, but they're... They're straight line stationary kicks, so they're either um, kick outs from a goal kick or, or, a, or a punt kick without having to change a direction, and not having that change a direction is probably protective. Um, and hip joint injuries are becoming more diagnosed. We don't know where that trend line is going to stop, but I think that we'll, we'll find that a percentage of our groin injuries have, do become hip over time. Um, and so they're the, they're the two mechanisms with ice hockey being different. And I'll finish off with a um, tribute slide. I've just come from Melbourne. Um, it's it's not, not too sad because he had a good life, but my, my father just died this week and I just came from his funeral. And he, but a, a tribute slide to him because he was, a, he was an Olympian um, um, in 52 and 56 in water polo. And water polo is a sport which I don't have great data for. Uh, would, you would have more incidents of groin and hip injuries in water polo than swimming. Um, if we had the data to, to show that, and hopefully we will soon. And uh, certainly his um, sporting background and medical background is also a, a, a psychiatrist led me into sports medicine, so it's, um, um, it, it's also a reason why he would be quite happy for me to have come straight from his funeral to present here because it's a, you know, an area that he'd have a lot of interest in. Um, and, and just on the epidemiology side, uh, again, I can say this without being too upset because he had a very long life and a good life, but um, epidemiology-wise, his cause of death was that he had a, a, a malignant melanoma and um, that would certainly be related to his background of playing water polo um, with exposed, um, you know, having, having European background, pale skin, exposed to a lot of sun swimming in Australia and, uh, and many other countries where he competed, um, and, and particularly in an age where, where we didn't have um, um, as much knowledge about um, protection from the sun. So it's, um, we, we, when we have the debates about um, you know, skin covering in um, the Arab countries, there's, there's some logic behind it potentially that if you live in a warm country like Australia and have the culture of not covering your skin, that's one of the, the, the things that we do have a very high rate of in Australia, which is malignant melanoma and other skin cancers. So um, it's a diversion, but an interesting one from an epidemiology point of view and, and one with a you know, personal interest for me this week. Anyway, thanks very much for inviting me.